Man, summer of 77 was a real bummer. Sweat plastering my t-shirt to my back. That same old Mustang convertible rolling by. And me stuck on this loser bike with the busted chain guard. Amy Carter, yeah, the president's daughter, breezing through town with the wind in her hair. And what does Ethan Davies have? A flat tire and a pocket full of nothing. Every pedal felt like a ton of bricks. But hey, a guy's got to hustle, right? Especially when there's a dream involved. Mine wasn't saving the world or nothing. Just Amy in the passenger seat. The radio blasting some journey. And me not caring where the road took us. Simple, right? Problem was, dreams like that take cold, hard cash. The kind I wasn't seeing much of. What with mom always needing help with bills and my kid brother eating us out of house and home. So when I saw that weathered help wanted sign flapping on the phone booth, it might as well have been a billboard flashing escape route. The thing is even beat up and faded. That sign sent a little shiver down my spine. Something just felt off. Maybe it was the way it hung crooked or how the ink ran a bit like it got rained on one too many times. But when you're this desperate, a voice in the back of your head saying, maybe don't, gets drowned out by the louder one shouting, payday! The next day, I kid you not, on my grandma's grave, the sign was gone. Like it never hung there at all. That should have been it, right? Should have thought it a weird fluke. A sign from the universe that my luck was about to change. Only, it didn't. The following morning, cruising down Main Street, if you could call our two-block strip of stores a Main Street, there it was again. Same phone booth, same faded lettering. Only this time, my gut was doing flips. That feeling, that cold little prickle on the back of my neck that says danger, didn't let up the closer I got. I swear, the closer I pedaled, the heavier my legs felt. If it wasn't for Amy Carter's Mustang, yeah, it was her daily route, don't judge, blurring by, I might have bailed right then and there. Up close, the sign wasn't any prettier. Construction work, the smudged letters read. No phone number, no fancy logo. Just that help wanted, hanging there like a dare. Something about it felt wrong. Like it was written with the same hand that hung it crooked in the first place. What the hell? I muttered. Gotta take chances sometimes, right? I hopped off the bike and ripped the faded slip of paper off the corkboard. The moment my fingers touched it, that chill set in again. Not summer heat, something deeper, like grabbing an icicle. And then this dude appeared, like out of freaking nowhere, just standing there beside me, two wide grins stuck on his face. Even in the broiling sun, I went goose flesh. See something you like, son. His voice had that slimy salesman tone to it. Uh, yeah, maybe... I tried to sound cool, like I wasn't creeped out by the way he had materialized out of thin air. Roy's the name, he said, sticking out a hand. The grip was clammy and lasted too long for comfort. I posted that sign. The dude couldn't have been more than ten years older than me, yet he had that old guy smell. Not the musty mothballs and Old Spice kind, but something off. Like the stuff they sprayed when an animal died under the porch... Something rotten under the surface sweetness. But then, he throws out a wage. More than double what I'd make flipping burgers at the diner. And right there, the Amy and Mustang dream flared up in my head again. And burned away that rotten smell. Or most of it, anyway. Maybe it was just the heat playing tricks on me. He didn't look like the boogeyman. Just a bit off. Eyes too bright like you see in those clowns at the county fair who always give you the creeps. But hey, so are half the dudes in this town. Could be good, honest work, right? Roy just kept on grinning, sizing me up. His eyes flickered between my rusty bike and the tattered sign in my hand, like he knew exactly what I was thinking. I swear, the dude could practically hear my brain ticking off Amy Mustang gas money freedom math. You got wheels, son? The way he said it made me want to lie, to say... Yeah, I've got a cherry Camaro waiting for me at home. Instead, I coughed and mumbled, Bike, gets me around. His grin got even wider, the kind that says he's just clocked my desperation. That's so. Well, I got a truck. Come by the diner tomorrow, seven sharp. We'll hash out the, uh, details. 
That was it. Not even a, you got the job or nothing. But with the way he said details, slow, like he was enjoying the word, my gut did a weird little twist. Should have followed that twist. Should have hopped on that rusty bike and pedaled home, far away from Roy and his slimy grin. But, see, here's the thing about desperation. It ain't picky. It'll take a half-decent chance over no chance at all, common sense and creepy vibes be damned. Seven sharp, I repeated, trying to sound confident. Like I wasn't a scrawny kid meeting some strange dude for a mysterious job. Roy gave me a little nod, like I passed some kind of test. Don't be late. He turned and walked away, whistling a tune I couldn't place. His hands were shoved in his pockets, setting off a faint jingle jangle. For some reason that sound, the tune and the jingling, sent a fresh shiver down my back. Hey! I called out, maybe louder than I intended. Roy stopped, turning just enough to raise an eyebrow at me. You ever need help around your place? You know, odd jobs, weekend stuff? The words tumbled out and I could practically feel myself blushing. What kind of idiot goes asking for more work from a guy he barely knows? But Roy didn't laugh. His eyes narrowed a bit, like he was peering through cracks trying to figure me out. Then that too-wide grin came back. Could be, he said. We'll see how tomorrow goes. And with that, he turned again, the jingle jangle of whatever was in his pockets fading in the sticky heat. I watched him go, feeling I don't even know what I was feeling. Maybe that cold shiver wasn't just the summer playing tricks. The rest of the day, I tried to shake it off. Told myself it was nothing, just my imagination run wild. A guy offering decent pay. Well, that should be a good thing, right? Told myself that Amy and Journey and the open road were worth a little weirdness. Thing is, that jingle jangle tune kept echoing in my head. Turns out, Roy and his truck were real. Seven on the dot, there it was in the diner parking lot. A beat up Ford that had seen better decades. I swear, the thing practically coughed out a cloud of rust as Roy opened the passenger door with a screech that set my teeth on edge. Hop in, he said, already behind the wheel. That jingle jangle was louder than ever, like the dude had a whole roll of quarters shoved down his pants. I slid in, feeling the cracked vinyl stick to my legs. The cab smelled of stale cigarettes and something faintly metallic. Appreciate the ride, I mumbled, clutching my backpack tighter than necessary. Roy let out a snort, something halfway between a laugh and a grunt. Admirable kid, showing up on time, ready to work with that... Contraption. He gestured vaguely towards my bike, which was chained up outside the diner. I felt my cheeks burn. It gets the job done, I muttered, the Amy Mustang dream fading a little around the edges. Roy didn't say anything more, just fired up the engine and pulled out into traffic. The radio crackled with some country tune I didn't know, but he didn't turn it up. The silence hung heavy in the truck between us, broken only by the rattling of the engine and that damn jingle in his pockets. The drive felt like it took forever. The diner was smack dab in the center of town. But Roy took roads I barely recognized, winding through scrubby fields and past dilapidated barns. The further we got from any sign of civilization, the more that unease clawed at my gut. Roy just kept on driving, staring straight ahead, a little half-smile on his face that gave me the willies. Finally, we turned down a dirt road even rougher than the others. The truck bounced violently, jolting me against the flimsy door. And then we were there. Roy's house wasn't what you'd call fancy. It was, well, it was a dump. The paint looked like it hadn't been touched since the Nixon era, and the roof sagged a bit in the middle. The surrounding yard was a mess of overgrown weeds and what might have once been a vegetable garden now just a tangle of dead vines. The air hung heavy around it, not just the summer heat, but something stale, like the house itself was holding its breath. That prickle on the back of my neck went into overdrive. Roy hopped out like he lived at the Ritz, oblivious to the way the place screamed, turn around and run. He didn't even look back as I fumbled my way out of the truck, eyes darting around. Come on then, don't be shy. He called out, already walking toward the porch. 
That jingle from his pockets was louder than ever now. For a split second, I thought about making a break for it. But there was that stubborn part of me, the part fixated on that Mustang, that kept my feet moving. Every step toward that decaying house felt like a step toward something bad. The workdays, if you could call them that, were a mess. Roy always had some cockamamie project going. Half-finished sheds, dug up trenches that went nowhere. Stacks of lumber that seemed to move from one place to the other overnight. Most of the time, he barely spoke, just paced around, muttering to himself, pausing every now and then to scribble something in a little notebook that was crammed into his back pocket. When he did talk to me, it was confusing. Stuff about the importance of good foundations, how everything has its place. He'd ramble on about tools and measurements, but his eyes never seemed to focus on what he was doing. The thing is, he wasn't a bad boss. The pay was exactly what he'd promised, handed over in crisp bills every Friday evening. No skimping, no sly deductions. And I'll admit, there was a weird satisfaction in the hard work, the ache in my muscles that was a world away from flipping burgers. But there was always that edge of wrongness, the long stretches of silence where he'd just stare at some half-painted board like it held the secrets of the universe, the whispers to himself, too low to make out, and always, always that jingle jangle echoing through the empty rooms of that house. There were days when I wanted to scream, break the stifling silence by asking what the hell we were even building out in this godforsaken place. But every time I opened my mouth, I'd see that glint in his eye, a darkness lurking just beneath his surface smiles. That and the jingle jangle always rattling around like a warning I couldn't decipher. Nights weren't much better. Back home after stuffing down Mom's meatloaf and listening to my kid brother go on about some stupid baseball game, I'd lie awake. Roy's house, with its peeling walls and crooked windows, would creep into my dreams. But it wasn't just the house. It was what was beneath it. What Roy muttered about in his half-sleep ramblings about those damn foundations. Then came the whisper at school. We were grabbing sodas from the machine outside the gym. Billy, me, and a couple of other guys. Billy, all freckles and big ears, was the go-to for town gossip. The human version of one of those crinkled supermarket tabloids. Hey Davies, you working out at Roy's place? He asked, a strange look in his eyes. I shrugged, keeping my voice casual, even though the name sent a familiar chill prickling over my skin. Yeah, so... He shot a nervous glance towards the other guys, but they were more interested in arguing over some girl in algebra. You heard things about that place? He asked, his voice barely a whisper. Now my dad always said never to put stock in rumors, but sometimes rumors grow in shadows, in the places where bad things happen. Like what? I tried to sound unimpressed. Billy fidgeted, kicking at a stray piece of gravel. You know, haunted stuff. They say old man Gannon, Roy's granddad or something, went crazy out there. Some kind of bad business in the basement. He trailed off, then gave me a sideways look. They say it's still down there. My mouth went dry. Still what? He just shrugged and took a long swig of his soda, like suddenly he'd lost interest in the conversation. But I saw it in his eyes, the same half-fearful half-excited spark I'd felt when that weathered sign had caught my eye. We were drawn to the darkness, us kids, even as something deep down screamed at us to run the other way. Of course, I told myself it was a load of bull. Ghost stories for bored summer afternoons. But that night, those whispered rumors crawled into my dreams, twisting themselves around the image of Roy's house, and that relentless jingle-jangle sound echoing from somewhere deep beneath the earth that's when the nightmares began. Not jump-scare, blood-soaked nightmares, but the kind that leaves you feeling wrong when you wake up. Like there was a cold handprint on your soul. A memory of something terrible you can't quite remember. And in every dream, there was that house, its windows like empty eyes, and somewhere below, the jingle jangle, louder and louder, until it was all I could hear. One morning on the way to the diner, that familiar dread clamped down on me so hard I had to pull the bike over. 
My hands were shaking, and the Amy Mustang dream had faded to a smudged shadow. Get a grip, idiot, I hissed at myself, slapping my cheeks hard enough to sting. It's a job, just a stupid, weird job. But even as I said it, I knew I was lying. There was something more going on at Roy's house, something lurking beneath the surface normality, just like in those half-forgotten nightmares. I could feel it in my bones. The question was, did I have the guts to find out what? Or was I going to keep working, keep collecting those crisp bills, and pretend that the jingle jangle wasn't getting steadily louder? It came on a Friday. I'd worked a double shift at the diner on top of the whole day with Roy. The ache in my bones screaming for a hot shower and a bed. But as Roy pulled up with that familiar screech of brakes, I braced myself. The jingle jangle was faint, but insistent, like a distant drumbeat pulling me away from the safety of home and sleep. Need an extra hand tonight, kid, Roy said, his grin a little too bright. Big project, big payout. My mouth worked, trying to form a no, a polite excuse about homework or something. But his eyes caught mine. I thought about my empty wallet, the Mustang, a faded image on a crumpled magazine page, my tired mom's slumped shoulders as she checked the kitchen cupboards one more time. Exhaustion and desperation. It's a potent mix. Makes even the smartest promises look flimsy under its harsh light. Maybe this was it, I thought. Maybe this was the push that would turn the Amy Carter dream into something real. All right, I heard myself say, my voice rough, almost unfamiliar. Roy's grin widened, and for a second... His eyes flickered. Not with happiness, not exactly, but with something hungry. That night, as Roy's truck bumped down that dirt road, I didn't look at the house looming ahead. Instead, I focused on my hands, calloused and sore, the proof of all those long days of work. Hands that would buy gas, grip a steering wheel, open a car door for a girl with a wide smile and sun-streaked hair. The image burned so bright, it nearly chased away the shadows gathering around us. We didn't work outside. For once, Roy's cryptic projects weren't about digging holes or hauling lumber. The air crackled with a nervous energy as he led me down a set of rickety stairs and into the shadowy basement. I fumbled for the flashlight I'd been instructed to bring, its weak beam cutting nervously through the thick darkness. The smell hit me first. Rotting wood, mold, and something else I couldn't place. Metallic, almost coppery, like old blood. My stomach clenched and I coughed, but Roy seemed unfazed. Don't be a baby. It's just the damp. He chuckled. The jingle jangle in his pocket a harsh counterpoint to the dripping silence. The flashlight beam caught a stack of plastic sheeting in the corner, piled high. A flash of unease tightened my gut. Weren't those the same kind we'd seen in the half-finished rooms upstairs? Then he flicked a switch, and everything changed. Harsh fluorescent bulbs flickered on, buzzing angrily. My eyes, accustomed to the dark, squinted against the sudden glare. The basement wasn't large. Bare concrete walls, rough, unfinished, and stained with streaks that looked suspiciously like dried blood. A workbench cluttered with tools that didn't look like anything I'd ever used for construction line one wall, the metal glinting under the harsh lights, and in the center of the room, a hole, a deep rectangular pit dug straight into the dirt floor. It was lined with rotting boards, their stench mingling with the other odors. I took a step back, my boots sinking slightly into the damp earth at the edge. What the hell is this? My voice came out tight, strained. Roy didn't answer at first. Just walked over to the pit and peered inside, his hands once again shoved deep in his pockets. The jingle jangle, echoing louder than ever. Foundations, he finally said, the word a low growl. Gotta lay him strong, gotta lay him right. He turned and fixed me with that hungry stare, the glint in his eye burning brighter than the buzzing fluorescent overheads. You ever think about what's beneath your feet, boy? All them layers of history. All them things people bury and forget. His voice was low, hypnotic, like he was trying to coax a feral cat out from under the porch. 
The words sent a shiver down my spine. A shiver that had nothing to do with the basement chill. You want that car so bad, don't you? He whispered, taking a step closer. Want to impress that little Carter girl? <sighs> I tried to swallow, but my throat was dust dry. He knew. How the hell did he know? Before I could answer, Roy was at my side. His hand clapped down on my shoulder, fingers digging in painfully. I can help you with that. He hissed, his breath brushing over my cheek, hot and foul. But you gotta do exactly as I say. Roy's house wasn't like any place I'd ever been. Now don't get me wrong. I've seen my share of dumps in this town. The kind with peeling linoleum and a permanent whiff of mothballs and cat pee. But this was different. A whole other level of wrong. First there was the cold. It wasn't just the lack of AC that you get used to in dead-end summer, but something bone-deep, seeping out of the very walls. Even with my sweat-soaked shirt clinging to my skin, I couldn't stop shivering. The air felt heavy, like something unseen was crowding in around us. Then came the smell. It hit me the second we stepped through the door. That familiar cocktail of rot and decay from the basement, only ten times stronger. The metallic note was sharper, too mixed with a sickly sweetness that turned my stomach. My gut twisted, screaming at me to run. But some stubborn, stupid part of me kept moving forward. Blame it on exhaustion, on the way Roy's eyes were locked on mine or on the faint gleam of new money, catching the light in my mind's eye. Whatever the reason, I followed him like a half-drowned rat, trailing a trail of cheese crumbs. The inside was a nightmare jumble. The living room was half filled with stacks of yellowed newspapers and worn out furniture shrouded in stained plastic sheets. The sharp smell of old dust hung heavy, mixing with that putrid sweetness. We weaved a path through the clutter, my shoulder brushing against one of the ghostly shapes, sending a shiver of disgust through me. Even stranger, half the doors in the hallway were covered in the same plastic sheeting the edges taped down tight. What the hell was he hiding in those rooms? The possibilities that flickered through my head were straight out of some cheap slasher movie, making every hair on the back of my neck stand on end. And always there was that jingle jangle from Roy's pockets, mocking me. Each step vibrated with it, every movement rattling out another few coins in that unseen pouch. Was it my imagination? Or did it sound closer than ever, less muffled by the layers of his clothes? We ended up in the kitchen. It looked vaguely normal, if you ignored the peeling linoleum and the faint streaks on the walls that were almost certainly not spilled coffee. The refrigerator hummed eerily, the only sound in the oppressive silence. Roy stalked over to it, yanking a crumpled soda out of the dusty depths. He tossed it at me, a wicked grin plastered on his face. It hit my chest, my fingers fumbling for a grip before it clattered to the grimy floor. Don't drop the prize, he cackled. I knew he was talking about more than just the soda. The can felt strangely heavy in my hand, like it was loaded with lead. What the hell is this? I choked out, staring down at the bright red and white label. Something about the colors, the shape of the brand logo. It wasn't right. But before I could make sense of it, Roy's hand landed on my shoulder again, hard. Now, son, you know I like you, he said, his voice silky smooth, sending a fresh wave of nausea through me. You're a strong worker. Determined. His fingers dug into my flesh, sending a spike of pain through my arm. I tried to shrug him off, but his grip tightened. But you gotta be smart and reliable, too. You understand that, don't you? He leaned in close, his breath hot against my ear, and I caught that awful sweetness again, like rotting fruit and weak old flowers tossed in a dumpster. I swallowed hard. My tongue felt like a lump of lead. Yeah, sure, Roy, whatever. His grin widened, showing a flash of chipped tooth. That's my boy. Now, let's get this show on the road, shall we? He shoved me towards the back door. The jingle jangle from his pockets a deafening roar inside my head. Outside, the sun was dipping below the horizon, casting long, blood-red streaks across the sky. 
But as the kitchen door slammed shut behind us, plunging us into semi-darkness, I swore the temperature dropped another 10 degrees. Goose flesh prickled every inch of skin. My teeth started to chatter. My bladder ached, the soda can still heavy and forgotten in my hand. I mumbled an excuse and practically ran toward the bathroom, desperate for any escape from Roy's suffocating presence and that unsettling sweetness clinging to the air. The bathroom wasn't much better. Dim light flickered from a single bare bulb, casting everything in long, grotesque shadows. Cobwebs hung from the corners, dusty trophies of neglect. The porcelain sink was cracked, a rusty faucet oozing out a trickle of tepid water. As I splashed my face, trying to scrub away the clammy film of sweat and fear, a small detail sent a jolt through me. On the back of the door, almost at eye level, hung a faded sign, out of order. But then I noticed it wasn't just the bathroom that was out of commission. Headed back to the kitchen, I caught myself glancing at the doorknob leading out to the backyard. It was different. Instead of the usual placement at waist height, it was positioned right around eye level. An awkward, impractical design. It seemed like a strange oversight, especially considering the way the house seemed to be meticulously, albeit bizarrely, cared for. Roy stood by the counter, a half-eaten sandwich clutched in one hand. He glanced at me, then back at the door. Leaving it open, he said, his voice dripping with a false concern that sent shivers down my spine. Shouldn't do that. You never know what might get in. My mind raced. Was it just a weird doorknob placement? A harmless quirk of an eccentric old man? Or was it something more? A subtle sign, a warning I couldn't quite decipher. I didn't trust myself to speak, not with Roy watching that glint in his eye growing wider. My hand on autopilot reached out and closed the door almost all the way, leaving a sliver of a gap. Roy's grin faltered for a second, the slightest flicker of annoyance crossing his face before it was masked by amusement again. Suit yourself, he said, his words punctuated by the rattle of plastic as he unwrapped another sandwich. Just be careful what you let loose. His words hung heavy in the air, the double meaning dripping like honey off a poisoned flower. My stomach churned, and for the first time, I considered the possibility that I wasn't just working for a strange old coot with a penchant for creepy projects. Maybe the whispers about the house were true. Maybe there was something more sinister lurking beneath the surface normality of it all. The thought sent a cold terror through me that had nothing to do with the bone-chilling air in the kitchen. As I slumped down on a creaky chair, the doorknob, at an unusual height, became a constant reminder of the unease that gnawed at me. Was I paranoid, spooked by a few stray rumors in a creepy house? Or was that sliver of a gap between the door and the frame the only barrier standing between me and something truly horrifying? Roy sat across from me at the kitchen table, the jingle jangle from his pockets almost unbearable in the tight space. The half-eaten sandwiches made my stomach royal in protest, mingling nausea with fear. He watched me, that grin still plastered on his face, like a clown mask frozen to his skull. Drink up, kid, he said, nodding at the half-crushed soda can I'd forgotten about. My fingers clutched the cool metal, but the condensation felt slick and clammy against my skin. I'm fine, I mumbled, my voice a pathetic squeak, even to my own ears. Roy's grin only widened. That's when I noticed it. The reason the soda can had looked so off. He'd handed me my favorite brand, cherry-flavored, the kind my mom never bought because of the sugar rush, reserved only as a rare treat on those scorching summer days. How the hell did Roy know? The coincidence was too much. My hand trembled as I picked up the can, and the jingle jangle from Roy's pocket seemed to intensify, like he was taunting me. But my throat was dust dry, the thirst and echo of the dread coiling in my gut. Desperate to relieve the parched throat sensation Roy's stare was causing, I brought the can to my lips and gulped. It felt wrong, too sweet, a syrupy coating that left a bitter aftertaste. But it quenched my thirst. 
The icy aluminum became a lifeline in my trembling hand, and I couldn't stop myself from gulping down the sickly drink. With each swallow, I felt a wave of warmth spread through me. Not the comforting kind, but a prickling, dizzying flush. My vision started to swim a little, the harsh fluorescent light of the kitchen blurring at the edges. Roy looked pleased. Feeling groovy yet, son. There was a smugness in his voice that set my teeth on edge. I managed a weak nod, my eyelids feeling impossibly heavy. Why the sudden exhaustion? I was used to long days, to sweating it out in the sun. But this was different. A heaviness, settling into my bones, a fog clouding my mind. Good, good, Roy purred, patting my hand reassuringly. His touch, a clammy jolt against the wave of heat rolling over me, made me want to jump out of my skin. We got a lot of work ahead of us. Something was wrong. Something beyond the creepy house and Roy's unsettling grin. The soda. He must have drugged it. The bitter aftertaste lingered in my mouth. A mocking reminder of my stupidity. I tried to push myself out of the chair to force my concrete heavy legs to move. But the warmth had turned to a crushing weight and every inch of my body rebelled. Roy's smug smile was the last thing I saw clearly before the fog descended. He leaned in, whispering something I couldn't hear over the deafening ringing in my ears. His grin faded, replaced by a hungry, predatory look. Roy also didn't look like himself anymore. He seemed like another person, an alter ego. As my eyes slid shut, a single thought cut through the haze. Amy Carter, the Mustang, the open road. They all shimmered and warped, fading away like a forgotten summer dream. I woke with a gasp, my head throbbing. The harsh kitchen light was gone, only a sliver of moonlight filtering through the dust-smeared window. For a disorienting moment, I thought I was home, back in my crummy room with its peeling superhero wallpaper. But then came the smell, the putrid sweetness mingling with the cold, damp earth, and the memory of it all hit me like a truck. Roy, the soda, the dizziness, the house. My limbs were weighted down, my muscles screaming in protest at the slightest movement. My vision swam, the world a hazy swirl of shapes and shadows. Every inch of my body shrieked that something was deeply wrong. The jingle jangle was gone, replaced by a dull roar in my ears and a pounding in my chest. My heart felt like it was trying to break free of my ribcage, its frantic beat echoing the mounting terror clawing its way up my throat. And then, a different sound cut through the chaos. A muffled shout. A frantic pounding. Like, was that my name? Each sip of the tainted soda sent another jolt of icy fire through my veins. The world around me tilted and warped. The kitchen counter melting into a grotesque mockery of itself. It was like being underwater. Everything muffled and distorted. My head throbbed in time with my heartbeat a desperate, panicked drumbeat that seemed to fill the room. Somewhere I knew I should scream, thrash, do anything to break free of the invisible bonds holding me down. But my limbs felt like they were encased in concrete. Roy's face loomed over me. His words were slurred. The edges of his clown-like grin stretched and warped. He was talking about, what was it, escapes, magic tricks... It was all a jumbled mess, a parody of those light-hearted carnival performers. Suddenly, he was holding a pair of handcuffs, dull metal gleaming in the half-light. Now, son, his voice slurred, both menacing and gleeful. Let's see how good old Roy is at his little tricks, shall we? The absurdity of it would have been laughable, if not for the terror-twisting ice-cold tendrils around my heart. My vision blurred further as he moved closer, the cuffs dangling in front of my face. The jingle jangle seemed to be coming from everywhere now, a cacophony that sent my senses reeling. Roy's hands fumbled as he tried to cuff my wrists. I think I moaned in protest, my mind still struggling against the tide of drugs and dread. There we go, my boy, he muttered, his voice thick with satisfaction, as he finally closed the cuffs tight. 
the sound of the metal snapping shut was like a death knell. A final, desperate surge of adrenaline pushed through the fog, giving me a brief moment of lucidity. I saw it then, clear as day beneath the distorted clown's mask, the shift in his eyes. Gone was the sly amusement, the veneer of aw shucks charm. There was something else now, a burning hunger, a darkness that had been there all along, simmering beneath the surface. I felt it like a cold hand around my throat. Now for the real magic, Roy crowed, his voice rising in a sing-song tone that sent shivers down my spine. He was fumbling with something in his pockets, something that jingled even louder than before. My heart hammered against my ribs, my breaths coming in ragged gasps. Whatever was next, I didn't want to see it. His hands emerged from his pockets, no longer empty. I tried to scream, to twist away, but my body wouldn't obey. He held a set of keys, a dozen keys jingling on a ring. He dangled them in front of me, the metal shimmering in the moonlight. See these, Ethan? His voice had lost all pretense of friendliness. It was raw now, cutting through the haze. These here keys, they open more than just locks, boy. They open cages. They open doors that should stay shut. He was rambling, his words making less and less sense. But the keys, they were the focus point. His eyes locked on them with an intensity that made my skin crawl. He started shuffling through them like a madman, the jangle echoing in the silent room, each sharp sound slicing through what remained of my composure. Gotta find the right one, don't we? He muttered, his eyes darting from the keys to my terror-stricken face and back again. Gotta unlock the real magic, see what's hidden deep inside. A sob tore itself from my throat. It was a primal sound ripped from the very depths of my fear. Was this it? Was this how it all ended? Not in a car crash or some dumb accident, but at the hands of a freak alone in this godforsaken house? You see, Ethan. Roy was right in front of me now. His breath hot against my face, rancid with the stench of decay. I got something special to show you. Something just for you. His hand shot out, the key ring glinting as he chose a single, heavy-looking key. It wasn't the sleek silver of a house key or the bright brass of a padlock. It was old, tarnished, and looked like it weighed a ton. This here, he whispered, a cruel smile splitting his face. This unlocks the real show. I couldn't look away. He was holding that terrible key as if it were made of the most precious gold a perverse kind of worship in his eyes. I tried to fight the panic, to focus on his hands, to find a weakness, anything. But my drugged brain betrayed me, the world a blur, his movements a dizzying swirl. He moved behind me, and all I could hear was the key, impossibly loud, as it slid into a lock I couldn't see, followed by a grinding, rusty sound, and, and then silence. A deafening silence settled over the kitchen. The world spun crazily and my breath rasped in my throat. Roy circled me like a predator stalking injured prey, his footsteps echoing in the stillness. His voice cut through the ringing in my ears. You always wanted more, didn't you, Ethan? More than this dusty little town. More than those sweaty days flipping burgers. There was no trace of warmth or kindness in his tone. It was all mockery now, his words dripping with venom. Well, here's your chance, kid, he continued, his grin wide and terrible. Pick a door, Ethan, any door, and if you can get out, then you'll be free to go. My body rebelled against my will. Even though my heart was a panicked drumbeat in my chest, my muscles were still sluggish, unresponsive. I tried to lift my head to make sense of my surroundings, but all I saw was blurred shapes, the world tilting and warping with every frantic twitch of my heavy eyelids. He grabbed my chin, forcing my face up. His grip was agonizing, even in my weakened state. Yet even with his fingers digging into my skin, I felt a jolt of clarity. The back door, right there, and this way. He gestured toward the hallway with its plastic shrouded doors. The front. So which will it be, boy? Which path to your freedom? 
A laugh burst from him. A high, echoing cackle that felt like nails on a chalkboard. He was enjoying this, savoring the torment. And then it hit me. The out-of-place doorknobs. The one leading outside positioned at eye level. The warped echo of it in the hallway. Roy had been taunting me all along. That strange detail, the one my exhausted mind had flagged, was somehow the key, or perhaps the riddle I had to solve. He must have seen the flicker of recognition in my eyes because his grin faltered. In that split second, I lunged forward, a desperate act of defiance. My drugged-out body didn't move as I wanted. I barely managed a clumsy twist, knocking Roy's hand away. I gasped for breath, every atom in my being screaming at me to run, to do something, anything. My vision swam, a swirling mix of shadows and distorted shapes, but somewhere, deep in the fog, a voice screamed. The same voice that had whispered a warning when I first saw that faded job offer. The one that screamed at me to run when I walked into Roy's house. That tiny voice, still alive in the hazy corner of my mind, cried out, Wrong! All of it is wrong! Don't choose their game! Roy recovered fast. He grabbed me by the hair, yanking my head back with such force that I saw stars. Stupid little brat! He snarled, rage contorting his face. Just pick a damn door. Prove your luck, win your freedom, or don't. The choice is yours. I coughed, tasting bile rising up in my throat. His grip tightened painfully. But in the midst of the pain, my muddled mind clung to that one shred of clarity. The doors, the high doorknobs, weren't an exit. They were a clue, a sinister testament to something Roy was hiding, something monstrous. Through a haze... I recalled the bathroom. That sliver of light beneath the door marked out of order. Was it always out of order? Or had something else forced him to keep it closed? Every instinct told me not to follow the rules. Roy wanted me to choose a door, to make me complicit in my own demise. There was no winning here. Not with my body heavy and poisoned. My thoughts scrambled. That out-of-place doorknob became my focus a sliver of rebellion against the horror washing over me. Roy was shaking me now, his face a mask of fury. Jews! He shrieked. But I couldn't. Wouldn't. Because in the end, he had already shown me the only door that mattered. The world tilted into a dizzying nightmare. Roy's roars bounced against my skull, amplifying my own ragged breaths into a horrifying chorus. The drug coursed through me, a poison that turned my body to lead. Every fiber of my being screamed out for escape. But I was trapped, a puppet with slack strings. Should have listened. The thought looped through the fog, each repetition a bitter accusation. Should have listened to the gut feeling twisting inside me from the moment I saw that tattered sign. Should have listened to Amy, her laugh echoing in my head, telling me I was chasing a fool's dream with this creepy old dude the soda, the sweetness that was never quite right. The wrong label, the odd familiarity. It was also obvious in hindsight. A poison laced with a perverse familiarity, mirroring the rottenness in the very air of this cursed house. Roy's hand tightened around my throat, a perverse lifeline in the drowning haze. Each gasp of air was a fight. The room pulsed, a warped heartbeat sinking with the throbbing pain in my head. I tried to blink away the tears, but they came anyway, hot and furious. This wasn't how it was supposed to be. Not here, not like this. Not because of some stupid, childish dream. Flashes of memory sliced through the haze. Amy and her Mustang, that sun-bleached smile, as she waved at a younger, stupider version of myself. My mom, tired but always with a hopeful glint in her eye, working overtime to keep our heads above water. Even Billy, with his big ears and bad jokes. Suddenly, all I wanted was one more sweaty shift at the diner, one more mindless gossip session about girls we could never dream of having. Normal, boring life never felt so tantalizingly out of reach. And then, like a cruel mockery, came the image of the doorknobs, the oddly placed handle that was my first whisper of warning the echo of it in the hallway, 
a twisted puzzle only a terrified, dying mind could grasp. Roy's glinting eyes, first fixated on those high handles, then on me, his prey. Not a boss, a warden, a monster. I gagged, a pathetic dribble of saliva escaping my lips. Roy's cackles echoed in my ears. Choose, boy, choose. But in the deepest recesses of my fading consciousness, I knew there was no choice. My options were an illusion, a deadly game he'd rigged from the start. The doors were never about freedom. They were cages, displays, and the prize inside, my own broken body. The Mustang would forever gleam in my mind, an untouchable symbol of naive hopes devoured by shadows. A wave of crushing defeat washed over me. Even defiance, even the courage to break his rules, was out of reach. The only control left was surrender. A final, helpless slide into the darkness that was waiting to claim me. It may have been the last, desperate act of my rational mind, or perhaps some strange primal force surging under the onslaught of poison and panic. Whatever it was, a sudden jolt tore me from the edge of oblivion. My eyes focused for the first time with some semblance of clarity on the half-open bathroom door. Was it always cracked like that, an overlooked detail? Or had I, in my first haze of confusion, cracked it open as a small act of rebellion? It didn't matter. It was there. A tiny sliver of light in the surrounding darkness. A chance, no, less than that. A flicker of defiance against a fate that seemed all too inevitable. Roy's grip loosened ever so slightly. He was focused on my face, eagerly anticipating the moment when the fight drained from my eyes, when I'd slump in defeat and pick one of his cursed doors. I used that precious second, that flicker of clarity, to my advantage. Instead of trying to wrestle free, I went limp, feigning the final stage of submission. My eyes fluttered to a close, and I even managed a pathetic groan. Roy's grin bloomed, the arrogance of a predator assured of his meal. That's right, boy, he crooned, his voice barely above a whisper now. Give in. Time to see what's behind the door. His grip relaxed just enough, and a surge of adrenaline flooded my system. I moved faster than I thought my drugged body was capable of. Twisting free of his grasp, I scrambled towards the half-open bathroom door. The world spun crazily, and I stumbled gracelessly, crashing against the door frame with a jarring thud that sent a spear of pain through my shoulder. But I kept going. Roy's roar of fury bounced off the walls as I scrambled into the bathroom, slamming the door shut behind me. The flimsy lock wouldn't hold him for long, but it was a barrier, a few precious moments snatched from certain doom. A desperate scan of the bathroom revealed a tiny window, too small for an adult, but perhaps with a flicker of hope for a skinny, desperate kid. The cobwebs that filled it tore away with a dusty cough, the rusty hinge screaming a protest into the night as I forced it open. Cold air washed over me, an almost painful shock against the fever sweat clinging to my skin. The window looked out over the overgrown backyard. The distance to the ground was at least ten feet. A dangerous drop under normal circumstances, almost suicidal in my condition. But fear had a way of sharpening the edges of desperation. I didn't hesitate. Every instinct told me not to fall into Roy's twisted game. Yet escape was the only game that mattered now. With a final surge of defiance, I squeezed through the window, my hands scraping against the rusty bars. The tattered remains of my shirt snagging and tearing. I hit the ground with a bone-jarring thud that knocked the breath from my lungs. And through a haze of pain, I heard it. Roy's triumphant yell as he smashed through the splintering bathroom door. I didn't look back. Instead, I forced my trembling legs to move. I staggered blindly into the darkness, the underbrush tearing at my exposed skin like a hundred tiny teeth. I stumbled and fell and crawled through prickly weeds that seemed to reach up, trying to snare me. Roy's shouts echoed through the night, growing closer. He knew these woods, knew every gnarled root and tangled branch. It was his hunting ground, and I was cornered prey. But that primal fear the last flickering ember of defiance, kept me going. The memory of the Mustang, pathetic, impossible dream now, 
was like a slap of icy water. No, it was more than that. It was Amy's wide, concerned face, as she'd warned me about rumors and reputations. It was my mom, hunched over a pile of bills, a single tear trailing down her cheek. Through the pounding in my head, the echoing shouts behind me, and the burning in my oxygen-starved lungs, a sliver of grim determination took hold. I wasn't just running from Roy, from the horrors of his house, from the monstrous hunger in his eyes. I was running toward the simple life I'd taken for granted, the ordinary problems, the everyday struggles. Suddenly, the greasy smell of the diner and the ache in my muscles from a long day's work didn't seem so bad. They were proof of life, of a future that might still be mine, if only I could escape the hunter on my heels. I ran until I thought my heart would burst, until the shouts behind faded into the frantic pounding of my own blood in my ears. Blinded by tears and darkness, I crashed through the undergrowth, driven by the knowledge that stopping meant becoming Roy's trophy, locked away in a room behind a door with an impossible knob. The next thing I remember is the sterile whiteness of a hospital room and the persistent beeping of machines I couldn't name. My skin itched where bandages were tightly plastered and the lingering nausea, fueled by hospital food and painkillers, made the world spin. A nurse, all crisp efficiency and practiced smiles, told me I was lucky. A passing driver found me collapsed on the roadside, a half-conscious bundle of torn clothes and raw terror. The detective came later. His rumpled suit and tired eyes spoke of too many sleepless nights and even darker cases. He introduced himself as Detective Miller, and then the questions began. And that's when it all fell apart. My account was a jumble of shadows and half-finished sentences. The soda that tasted all wrong, the basement with its sickening smell, Roy's house with its chilling air, the doors with the high doorknobs, each detail felt both razor-sharp and impossibly distant, like pieces of a fractured mirror, and always the jingle-jangle in my ears, a constant echo of something unseen, unheard by anyone except me. Roy Gannon, the detective said, his voice low. We know him. Quiet fella, not much family to speak of. House has been in the family for generations. His gaze was piercing, and I could almost see the wheels turning in his head, the pieces not quite adding up. Injured kid, suspicious house, and a story that sounded more like a fever dream than anything concrete. Did he hurt you? There was a hesitation in his voice, a hint of something beyond his professional detachment. Had there been whispers about the house? Stories brushed under the small town rug? I... I don't know. I choked out. Even to my own ears, it sounded weak, pathetic. But how could I explain? How could I translate the feeling of wrongness, the glint in Roy's eyes, the cloying sweetness clinging to the air into evidence? The detective sighed, a weary sound in the quiet room. Son, something happened out there. Something that scared you bad. Was it drugs? Bad trip? For a moment I considered it. It would have been easy, explaining my terror away as a reaction to a tainted soda, a foolish kid chasing a dangerous high. But something inside me, a stubborn shard of defiance, refused. No, I said in my voice, a hoarse whisper. It was different, bigger. The detective studied me for a long moment. Let me ask you something. You said Roy, he always had this jingle jangle about him? Like what? Keys? A flash of icy recognition struck me. Keys! Roy with his ring of tarnished keys, the way his eyes gleamed brighter than the metal as he selected the one to unlock my fate. I remembered the rusty grinding in the kitchen, the heavy silence that followed. Not keys to open doors. Keys to lock them. I tried to put it into words, but my voice trembled. Different, not keys. Not exactly, more like... My mind fumbled, desperately trying to grasp at some kind of explanation. He waited, his pen hovering above his battered notebook, the silence expectant. It was like... And then, 
The image hit me with startling clarity. A child's mobile, the kind that hangs over a crib. Shiny objects, all shapes and sizes, dangling from thin strings, each one clinking softly against the other with every slight breeze. A haunting, delicate sound that should be comforting, but was now forever tainted with terror. It was like those things they hang over babies, I finally forced out, the words catching in my throat. A whole collection of, of something, tinkling and jangling together, like a, a wind chime made of nightmares. The detective closed his notebook with a soft click. You rest now, son. We'll look into it. Maybe Roy's just a strange, lonely old man with a penchant for collecting rusty stuff. A forced smile played on his lips, an attempt at reassurance, for both our sakes. But as he turned to leave, his eyes held a flicker of doubt. He might not have believed my jumbled tale, but there was a hint of unease in his gaze, a suspicion that maybe, just maybe, there was more to Roy Gannon and his house of horrors than met the eye. A day later, the news anchor's voice was a distant drone, the words swirling around me like disembodied ghosts. They spoke of bodies, of victims, of a darkness that had been lurking beneath the surface of our quiet town. And I knew, even though my memories were still fragmented and laced with the poison of whatever Roy had given me, that I was the reason they were there. I was the survivor, the boy who'd clawed his way out of the pit of despair and dragged a monstrous secret into the glaring light of day. The irony was a bitter pill to swallow. They never found the source of the jingle jangle. It disappeared, along with Roy, swallowed up by the grim aftermath of the investigation. But the sound echoed in my nightmares, a haunting reminder that some things can never be unseen or unheard. The Mustang remained a distant dream. Mom and I got an old, rusty sedan, something reliable and safe, to get me to and from the new job I took at the hardware store. Billy sometimes stopped by, a hesitant curiosity in his eyes as he watched me measure out nails and hammerheads. Amy Carter, bless her, sought me out one sunny afternoon, a flash of that wide smile I'd once longed for. She didn't ask for details. She just offered me a ride, the top down, the wind whipping through our hair, as we cruised the same two-block main street, I'd pedaled along on my busted bike. It was a simple act of normalcy. An unspoken lifeline, tossed to me when I most needed it. Life went on as it always does. The town buzzed with whispers for a while. But the horror faded into a cautionary tale. A dark stain on our collective memory. And for me, there were scars. Both seen and unseen a tremor in my hands that made precise measurements difficult, a wariness on cloudy days when the air felt too thick, too heavy, a lingering distrust towards overly friendly smiles. Yet, the biggest change wasn't in what I lost, but what I gained. I learned the weight of an ordinary day, the beauty of a simple sunrise, and the fierce protectiveness of a mother's weary eyes. And sometimes, in the quiet of the night, when the shadows seem to stretch a little too long, I think of Roy. I think of his clown costume locked away in some evidence room, of the tattered help wanted sign forever buried in a landfill. And I think of that jingle jangle and wonder if maybe, just maybe, it's still out there, a haunting symphony floating on the breeze, waiting to ensnare another unsuspecting dreamer the thought sends a shiver down my spine. But this time, it's followed not by the cold terror of a helpless victim, but the iron determination of a survivor. Because if that jingle jangle ever comes for me again, I'll be ready. I'll know exactly what kind of monster hides behind the wrong kind of cold. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Quantum Dispatches, and stay tuned next week for another thrilling adventure. Thank you for listening. 